Welcome to WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series from Pharma Voice. This episode was made possible by a generous sponsorship from Ogilvy Health. For more information, visit OglevyHealth.com. In this episode, Taryn Grohm, Editor-in-Chief of Pharma Voice Magazine, meets with Kate Cronin, President, Ogilvy Health. Kate, you have an impressive 20 years of experience in PR, healthcare marketing, and 16 of those at Ogilvy. What are some of the biggest shifts you've seen in terms of healthcare advertising and PR over the last, you know, 20, 25 years? Well, thank you for, for having me on the show, Taryn, and I'm delighted to be here. And 25 years does feel like a very long time, <laughs> because it is. And in that time, there has been so much change that it's, it's really hard to pin it down to just a few. But I can start off with the fact that in healthcare advertising and PR, we are seeing the spend just continues to increase over the years. And I think that the increase is attributable to not just pharmaceutical companies spending, but hospital systems are now spending in advertising and PR at a, at a, at a rapid rate. In addition, there are uh, disruptors in the market. Uh, If you look at Amazon and Google, they weren't there years ago. So I think that the the influx of of data and technology is something new and um, is really changing the way we do our business. There's also the blending of disciplines. So years ago, when when I joined, I was in PR. And PR was separate from advertising and other disciplines. And now what's happening is the way we communicate is through the blending of disciplines where advertising, PR, digital, social, are all part of an integrated ecosystem and no discipline sits alone. So they support each other. So our clients are now demanding, not asking, but demanding that different agencies sit together, discuss the, 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 the strategy, and then come up with solutions that can be discipline agnostic, but ultimately are then deployed by each agency. So that I think is a change from years ago where everyone was working in their own silo. You didn't really talk to the ad agency if you were in PR, they were viewed as separate. I also think that the rise of digital and social over the years has contributed to a big change in in healthcare. Healthcare was, healthcare advertising and PR was sort of the, the flow to the gate in terms of, of utilizing digital and social platforms, but now they're there and they're embracing these platforms to reach audiences, to reach patients, physicians, um, and that includes doing more initiatives with Facebook and Instagram, working with content engines, like new content engines that didn't exist years ago, like Reddit, and Refinery29 to get healthcare information out. In fact, it's funny, the men in my household actually go to new content engines like Deadspin and Barstool Sports. And I was thinking, maybe I can reach them with men's health messages. Those are new, interesting platforms that maybe we haven't gone to before. Um, so so getting creative about health care information and reaching, reaching folks in new ways, that's really changed a lot over the years. And then people are getting their, their information from disparate places. And I think that the news it used to be the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, those, that's where you got your news. Now you're getting your news from all these digital platforms. Um, some people just read Twitter and get their news from Twitter. Some people get it from Facebook. And some people actually get it from micro-influencers. So the whole world has changed. And the rise of these platforms and the focus on snackable bites versus reading long-form articles. And we have to communicate now in snackable bites. And some people do want long-form articles. And we can create that as well. So I think that that is a big change since when I when I started. And then finally, I think another area is just the rise of data and analytics. Years ago, we didn't have the data and analytics that we do today. And now we can deploy that to figure out, are we reaching the right person? Are we reaching the right customer? How do we deploy it? Do our tactics work? Are they making sense? Do we need to revisit and pivot? Can we be nimble? 
so these are all things that that again didn't didn't exist back in the day so um and you know, like i was in the dinosaur age so um <laughs> i really am not that old but um i do have a tiktok account account taryn so i just wanted to share that with you so i am uh new and hip i'm a you hip mom <laughs> I love that. Um, I had to have my nephews explain what TikTok was to me. So I am not that. <laughs> um, you know, it seems like we are moving faster and faster and it's accelerating at an exponential speed. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we were still talking about the importance of journal ads. And now here we are. It's not even that long ago where we're talking about whole new pat platforms, that, as you just described. So where do you see going in the next five to 10 years? What trends are you keeping your, your fingers on right now? So a few things. We're watching all the different platforms that are launching. Some of them have a meteoric rise. Uh, TikTok is an example of having a meteoric rise. Now, I think there are obviously targets, the younger audience for sure, but also there's questions around um, the, the the ownership of TikTok and whether or not this is something you should get involved with. But other than that, I mean, I think that there's there are other things that are happening that are shaping kind of the, the future. The hot trends uh, include the rise of behavioral science in shaping communication strategies. So if you look at behavioral science, it can actually feed your strategy for communication. And I'll give you an example. Um, we work in the vaccine space. And as you know, there's a huge contingent of anti-vaxxers who are out there, and it has caused an influx of measles, mumps, diseases that you thought you really weren't gonna see again are now back because of anti-vaxxers. And so just telling people that vaccinating is good for you isn't enough to necessarily get them to do it because of all their concerns around, around safety. So we looked at, we used behavioral science to help feed our approach. And part of that approach was looking at the physician and the physician's role. And, it, and we found that if a doctor equivocates on a vaccine, so if you press a doctor and say, do I really need this vaccine? If the doctor equivocates, then you may be less likely to get the vaccine, or take the vaccine. If a doctor is, is more firm and explains that yes, this is an important vaccine, you should have this in your arsenal, you're more likely to do it. So that is how, one example of how behavioral science can feed an approach, so the role of the doctor. So part of that can be training the doctors in how they communicate with their patients when it comes to vaccines. So that's one way that I think um, it, over, the, over the next five to 10 years, I think behavioral science is gonna play an integral role across all healthcare communication. I also think that um, the rise of the, the micro-influencer as well mm -hmm. will, play, will play a big role. I think there are a number of micro-influencers in health and that can be a micro-influencer when it comes to things like mindfulness or mental health or addiction where they actually can influence change more than perhaps a large campaign could. Um, and then finally, one of the things we're seeing, and I think is gonna be a continued trend, and this is, as you, as we were talking earlier, Taryn, it, the importance of brands doing good mm. and communicating the good that they're doing. I think, I think people, patients, consumers look at brands and say, if this is a company that does good, I'm more inclined to, to buy this product or I'm more inclined to like this company. And it's not just about doing good because you have to, it's doing good because you really need to show you're making a difference in the world. And so I think a lot of companies are now um, more focused on that than ever before and in the healthcare space. It's interesting, and I think, you know, when we think about COVID and all the tragedies that are involved with it, but one of the silver linings is that people are becoming more involved in clinical trials, for example. They're understanding the science um, in a greater detail. So we may see that shift, and so companies, and the, as a result, the pharmaceutical companies' reputations are starting to rise again, which I think is a positive to come out of all of this tragedy. 
Yeah, I would actually say I was on a Fortune Brainstorm Health um, conference call this morning, a Zoom call, and, uh, you know, this came up during Julie Gerberding from Merck was speaking. And one of the things she said is, you know, for years, pharmaceutical companies have suffered and been at the bottom of the of the rankings in terms of trust of industries. And uh, literally at, after banking, I think pharma came last. And now this is an opportunity for them to shine. And I think the race to find treatments, the race to find vaccines, gives pharmaceutical companies the opportunity to rise above it and to show their value to society. And um, I, we, I think the point was that it was a very good one. And I think that this is really a great opportunity for them to continue to show that they are delivering for the health and wellness of society in, in this COVID world. The other thing, when we talk about what's going on and relevance in the world we are in today, with Black Lives Matter and racial inequalities and underserved communities, I think that there is going to be more of a focus in the healthcare community about access and access to medicine, access to improved care, and communicating that access very aggressively. Because in the past, and I remember years ago, Taryn, when I was working in a campaign and we had one component of it, I think it was in hypertension, one component of it was the multicultural communications component and very small budget for that. When in fact, the, the people who suffered from hypertension tended to be from the black Hispanic communities. So now I think those days are over, thankfully, where marketers understand they need to, they need to actually spend against that category to reach those people. They need to go where those folks are and not just set aside a small at component of the budget to reach them. So I think it, it, it actually is a change for the good, and I think that's going to continue over the next several years. Agreed, and I think that's going to blend back into that clinical trial space, too, and looking at more diverse yeah. patient populations to bring people who are going to be the end users of these drugs into those clinical trials and increase that diversity of that patient pool. So, I, again, I think yeah. that's a great step forward. Um, you know, and we can talk about, you know, public health issues going all the way through and how that resonates in terms of where we are today as a society as well. But we don't have two hours. We can, we yeah. have 20 minutes. <laughs> um, uh, but we can, to, we can talk about that offline some more. I'd love to discuss that with you. Let's talk about some of the successes you've had in terms of launching brands. And you've done so for a number of different companies. Um, Given the trends that you outlined earlier and the converging of so many media in which a campaign has to now touch, if it's digital, online, print, whatever it may be, what are some of those key factors that are integral to a successful launch? Has that changed or are the principles still the same or do, they, do these need to evolve as well? Yeah, that's a great question, Taryn. And I think the principles have remained the same, but I think there's a lot of noise in the system with all of the different channels that are out there. You know, it, digital, you used to think digital was its own silo. In fact, Ogilvy at one point had an Ogilvy digital op, um, operation under it. And now digital sits across everything. And so I think if you look at, uh, that's, that's changed since several years ago. But if you look at launching products, you have to cut through and figure out, do you know your patient? Do you know you or your customer, basically? How well do you know them? What is the journey that they're going on? And where, where are they getting their information? And then from there, mapping out what your communications plan will look like. I think also a lot of scenario planning fits in as well in terms of regulatory milestones. That's always been key to a successful launch is having your scenario planning mapped out. But as I mentioned earlier to you, uh, the IAT model, integrated agency team model, is really important because those touch points within a patient journey are different. It could be whether they're watching TV, whether they're old school, I guess we call it, watching TV versus, um, versus a Roku, uh, whether they're getting their information from their, their mobile phone or whether they're getting it from an iPad understanding where they're getting their information and then where they're going. And there are so many different places 
that they go to. As I mentioned to you, my husband and my son, you know, Deadspin and all these platforms that I don't really go to. So knowing where they go and then reaching them with the right information at the right time. And I think those are, those are all the same pillars of, of how you launch a product. And now I just think there's just more of them to sift through and understanding where they get their news, who do they trust, those have all changed because the rise of the micro influencer and the macro influencer, that could be where they're getting all their information from. 10 years ago, you didn't have micro and macro influencers. 10 years ago, it was, oh, well, they're getting their information from their doctor, or they're getting it from a journal, or they're getting it from a newspaper, or they're getting it from TV, right? Right. Now, that it was like four or five places. Now, contrast it to today where it could be, you know, 30 or 40 places. I mean, I can't tell you how many different places I get my information on. There's like probably still about four or five of my trusted places where I go for health information. But, you know, we have to figure that out. And then where do you, where do you make your investment as a marketer? What are the best choices for making those investments? So it's, it's, it's a bit harder now because it's, um, it's a much bigger space that we're playing in. Sure. You sit in a seat of influence in the industry. You had a call this morning with Forbes and with Julie Gerberding. So you obviously have some influence in the industry. Where and how do you exert your influence to, I don't know, affect change? When I'm talking to senior clients and uh, I'm having a discussion about what, what, what they should be doing, I use that as an opportunity to talk about what's going on culturally and relevance and making them understand or helping them, I should say, understand why they should be doing certain things. So for example, if a client has a budget set aside and I truly believe that part of that budget needs to go to serving underserved communities or, or focusing on access and communicating around access programs, my job, as I see it, is to make the case to that client to explain why they should care. Because it's, it, it, I'm, I have, I'm seeing across the board what all the clients are doing and what companies we work with are doing, and I'm able to make the case by showing and benchmarking what others are doing. And I think that's an important role to play. And I, and I, I think also helping clients who are senior women helping them grow. And a lot of what I do is also working with my senior clients who are women and helping them elevate themselves within their organization or their own visibility within the healthcare communications arena. So I like to, to do that when I can. And I think it's an important part of my role at Ogilvy. And I also get a lot of satisfaction out of, out of doing that. That's a great lead into my next question, which is, um, I understand you are a founding member of Ogilvy's Women Leadership Professional Network um, and a member of WPP's Women's Leadership Faculty, or as it, you call it, WILL. So let's talk mm -hmm. about um, why mentoring women is so important to you. And then we'll go into how Ogilvy Health is addressing gender diversity, as well as diversity and inclusion. So I grew up in a military household. My father was a colonel in the army and I grew up at West Point. Interesting background. I it was all men. There was some women. When I when we moved to West Point, I was a kid and that year was the year they the first year they accepted women. And I remember walking through campus and seeing the women at West Point and at the time they were not allowed to look feminine at all. And it just struck me that what they did is they accepted women, but they were molding women to be like men. And for some reason that stuck in the back of my head. And, and I ultimately was invited to go to West Point. I was a swimmer and, and they tried to recruit me to be on the swim team. And I thought, well, I don't want to stay here at West Point, and I also don't want to be a woman look like a man. <laughs> so I ended up going, oddly enough, to a women's college. And I found that at a women's college, I had a lot of freedom because women were in charge. Women did were on all the committees. The women were uh, 
the only uh, sporting event. So women came to support women. And it was a fantastic experience. And I actually spent my junior year at a, a co-ed school and found that my, I was pre-med and I, my lab partner was always trying to take over. And I thought, well, you're not going to take over this project we're doing. We, we do it equally. And I, I remember it. thinking that would never happen at my, at Smith College. At Smith College, you know, women are in charge. So anyway, that mentality kind of stuck with me. So it's always been a focus of mine to help mentor other women and grow other women. And if you look at my leadership team, uh, they're, they're mostly women. And I get a lot of joy out of having mentored women. And over the years, I've mentored women who have gone on to run their own healthcare practices. In fact, four of them went on to run their own healthcare practices. So I'm very proud of that. I'm sad that they left, but proud that I had something to do with them going on and, and you know, fought, growing their careers. So I think it's important to mentor women. I think we should give them the same opportunities as men. I have two girls, and I want to make sure that they get all the same opportunities that my son does. Um, and I think that it is important to show that you can have it all. And maybe you don't do it all well. Maybe you do it some days you do it well, sometimes some days you don't. But I think there's a lot of pressure on women. And I know that um, about, I guess about 10 years ago, maybe less than 10 years ago, I, I noticed that women were dropping out of healthcare communications or advertising or PR at a certain stage. And they were dropping out because they were having children and they felt that they couldn't do it all. And I, I strongly encourage them to stay. And I encourage them to stay with, what do you need to be successful? That was the question. Do you, do you need three days a week, four days a week, three at home, two here, whatever? And I'm very flexible about that because I get it. It's not easy and everyone has challenges being a mom and working. And I think that as Shelly Lazarus, who's my mentor, once said to me, you're never going to be perfect. You shouldn't worry about, you know, basically you shouldn't worry about the dust bunnies that are building up uh, under your bed because that doesn't matter. Worry about what matters. And I think I've taken that to heart and I, I, I try to instill that with, with other women. I remember one point a couple of years ago, we had an intern who asked me to coffee and I said, sure, I'd love to get a coffee. So we went downstairs and I was telling him about my focus on mentoring women, although I mentor men too. And he said uh, that it was interesting because the, uh, there was a woman who was an intern sitting next to him and she, she asked him, how did you get coffee with Kate? And he said, I asked. Yeah. And I thought that was just so, so true because as women, we worry, well, if you, if she says no, that must, you know, that I don't want her to feel in this position where she feels she has to say yes. And so I thought that was just very enlightening because men don't generally think like that. Yes means yes. No means no. If you want, you know, you get a coffee, you want to get a coffee or not, that's the answer. So anyhow, that's, that's my focus on, on mentoring women. That's great. And so, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, diversity and inclusion across the industry now with a finer focus, um, including women and figuring out how to bridge those gaps. So what is Ogilvy doing specifically in terms of looking at diversity and inclusion yeah. in your work? Yes. Yeah. So we're, we're taking a hard look at, um, we're taking a hard look at diversity and inclusion and we've had uh, DNI uh, chief diversity inclusion officer for years and she's done a fantastic job but we know there's a lot more work that has to be done and particularly um, in the in 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 the numbers that we see it's not where it needs to be I think for the for the work we did with women leadership professional network WLPN at Ogilvy We've done some great work. We've fostered and grown a lot of women. We also had a program called 30 for 30, which is 30 men partnered with 30 women and men being sponsors for women. And this, I was, I was in the inaugural class of 30 for 30. And now what it's become is 30 for 30 is 30 women, not all women, but a lot of women sponsoring uh, 30 women leaders. 
And the beauty of the sponsorship program was that it, the men would learn from the women, like what are the struggles that they deal with. And, and, and obviously the men then would also kind of instill some thinking to the women. So um, we, we use that program as more of a partnership program to, to grow women leaders. And then we have our DNI team that does a lot of initiatives around um, diversity and inclusion um, for uh, young professionals, for um, people of color. We have we have several uh, what do you call them affinity groups uh, within Ogilvy that have programs specific to those members. And I think um, that we've come a long way. But I, if we look at the numbers, to be honest with you, we're nowhere near where we should be. And I think this. Um, Black Lives Matter movement and highlighting racial inequalities is, is uh, awakened everyone in the industry to the problems that we have in, in this area in particular. That's great. And let's look to the future where those numbers start to Correct. become more equitable. Yep. So better days ahead, let's hope. Yes, exactly. When you look to building your teams, what are some of those qualities you look for um, in terms of, you know, bringing people along to that executive level? I think the qualities that shine when I'm looking to move folks up is is fearlessness, ability to ask questions without worrying how you look. If, oh, is this a dumb question? Just ask the question. Curiosity, I think if you're curious, I think that goes a long way because, again, that gets you to learn more. And I say if you're uncomfortable, that's a good place to be. So if if people are happy to be uncomfortable and, and try new things, they are definitely ready to continue to move up into the C-suite, conquering your fear or conquer your complacency, frankly, because I think that can be an issue as well when you get too comfortable. I've been with Ogilvy for 16 years, and I've had so many different jobs really within Ogilvy, even though most of it has been within health and PR. The roles have changed every two or three years in terms of the responsibilities, and I think that keeps me uncomfortable and keeps, and I, and I encourage anyone who wants to move into leadership roles to, to do that. Don't get complacent. Be fearless. Be curious. And, um, you know, hard work gets you far, for sure. I just had this conversation with my daughter the other night. She's like, hard work should, should be enough. I said, it's never enough. Anybody can work hard. That's right. That is not enough to get you to the top. It's, it's that nice. curiosity. It's the fearlessness. All of this will get you up there. Perfect. Any specific advice to women who may want to look to that C-suite? If those are the table stakes of getting up in the executive level, but what are some of those unique challenges that maybe women face? I, I think for women, to, to get to the C-suite, find a sponsor. Because as you know, you look at the executive leadership teams of large companies, and it's still mostly men, mostly, uh, I would say, not as diverse as it should be. And so if you want to move up the ladder, find a sponsor who's sitting at that table. Because that's the key. If somebody says, oh, I was talking to Jane Doe and she told me she's interested in this, we should put her name in. Those conversations are happening in a boardroom maybe. And if they don't know who you are and you don't have somebody representing you, it's very hard for you to be heard. So that's why we had this 30 for 30 sponsorship program at Ogilvy. It's, It's basically about making sure that someone at a high leadership level is aware of your wants, your needs, your desires, your abilities, and is able to work them in that room for you so that when that big job comes up or running a country or running a network or whatever it may be, somebody puts your name in the hat because you've built that relationship with them. You've asked them to be your sponsor. And don't be afraid to ask for someone to be your sponsor. Because quite frankly, I think they'll be flattered. It's, and, right. and again, if they say no, they may recommend someone else who should be your sponsor. So you can always ask. And that goes back to the fearless. Because if you are fearful, 
you're not going to ask the question and it's not going to create that cadence that needs to happen to get you to where you want to go. Perfect. So let's think about your, in terms of your career, is there anything that you know now that you wish you had known as you were moving up the ranks? Like you're giving great advice out there to folks who are listening to this podcast who have those C-suite aspirations. But if there, if you could go back and do something differently, is there something you know now that you wish you knew then? It, yeah, it's if if I if I knew now how approachable leaders are, I mean, if I knew uh-huh. then how approachable right. leaders are, I would have done it. I think I I think I originally when I was much younger um, had a fear that oh I don't want to waste someone's time or I don't want to I don't want to impose or force them to ask. To, you know, to, to answer that question of will you grab lunch with me or a quick meeting or coffee. So that's why I, I really highlight that so much because it's the one thing I should have done much sooner. And I think I probably didn't think that it was something I should do. And so the sooner you get that embedded in your head, the better. And that's what I would, that's what I would recommend. Perfect, Kate. That's perfect. And finally, tell me about an accomplishment or a wow moment that shaped your career or changed the trajectory of your career or something that left you left a uh, lasting impression on you. I'm going to go way back with my wow. wow moment because I was quite young and I was um, working with the C-suite of, at the time, Smith Klein Beecham. So I was working with Jan Leshley, J.P. Garnier, uh, their head of regulatory, their head of medical, and I was dealing with uh, RX to OTC switch of one of their products. And literally, it was me going down to Philly, working in a boardroom with the C-suite on a weekly basis to develop a presentation to the FDA as to why they should switch this product. And I remember. Uh, I remember one of the presenters getting up and I corrected him on a slide. This was in a rehearsal. And I remember the CEO turned to me and said, that is a great point. None of us ever would have thought of that. It was something like that. I'll ne- I mean, the words I'm probably not getting correctly, but I do remember that moment thinking that I was valued regardless of how young I was, that the head of this um, large company actually respected me. I'm working with them weekly. We went down to the FDA for the hearing and we sat in the audience while they were about to give the presentation. And, and I remember the head of regulatory was having a, a problem and I got up from the audience and I, I helped him with his slides. And I sat back down and my client basically said to me, or said to my boss at the time, that's a career maker moment for her. And I remember thinking that It was because it built my confidence. I actually ended up getting an award from Smith Klein Beecham that was a, they named a star after me. And Taryn, kid, I, I, I have never found the star. It was one of those, you know, cheesy things where they name a star after you. But I remember and I, I will never forget it. I went up on stage. CEO gives me the star for all my work with this, with the switch. And I sit back down and Shelly Lazarus is sitting next to me and she said, congratulations, that was a wonderful thing. And I looked at her and I was like, thank you. And then years later, I ended up working with Shelly and she became my mentor and boss. And just, I will never forget that because she was there when I got my star. (laughs) Awesome. Okay, I know. I know. That was my wow moment. And I knew, I knew that confidence was everything. And not being afraid to say what you say what you need to say, even though you're with like the top people in a company and you're just the kid, say it because it'll give you the confidence. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. But if you're right, it goes a long way in building your confidence. Kate, thank you so much for sharing that great story. And it just shows the importance of confidence, as you say, and recognizing that you have a voice and you should use your voice. And thank you so much, too, for sharing your your insights in terms of the trends and what we need to be looking for as we go forward um, into some uncertain territory in the next you know, 12 to 24 months as we all come out of COVID um, in terms oh, of yeah. influencing 
healthcare advertising and public relations. So thank you so much for your tremendous insights. Well, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed chatting with you and um, I hope you have a great week. Thank you for listening to this episode of WOW, the Woman of the Week podcast series by Pharma Voice. And thanks again to Ogilvy Health for sponsoring this episode. For more information, visit OglevyHealth.com. And don't forget to check out our other episodes at PharmaVoice.com slash WOW. This 2020 program is copyrighted by PharmaLinks, LLC.